Hello, this is Father John Brown again. Uh, Father John Brown coming from Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in, in Marietta, Georgia. This is the fourth correction, fifth class on uh, our, our series called uh, The End Times Evangelical versus Orthodox. We will be talking about the unique role that uh, uh, Israel plays in the differences between the Orthodox and uh, uh, our, our dispensationalist evangelical friends. So let's get started. So far in this series, we've talked about the duality in dispensationalism between Israel and the church. And in that context so far, uh, when I, we've talked about Israel, we've been talking about ancient Israel. However, beginning in 1948, uh, has begun the modern state of Israel. The two are not exactly the same, uh, uh, certainly from an Orthodox perspective, uh, but it, the, the dispensationalists and Orthodox have a very different view of the modern state of Israel and its significance. One of the most striking features of dispensationalists is their unwavering and unquestioning support of the modern state of Israel. Ever since the founding of the Jewish state in 1948, American dispensationalists have seen it as a major fulfillment of biblical prophecy and a sign of the imminent end times. Here's a video I'd like to show you, uh, which uh, is I think uh, describes this uh, very well. Policy toward Israel begins in Canada. Reverend John Hagee is the pastor of San Antonio's Cornerstone Church. He's one of Israel's strongest U.S. supporters and the founder of Christians United for Israel, a group that lobbies for pro-Israel policies. If we can get 50 million evangelicals in America to join hands with 5 million of the Jewish people in the United States of America, it will be a marriage made in heaven. Reverend Hagee says his friendship for Israel is part of his effort to fight anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is sin, and in Christian theology, sin damns the soul. It is absolutely ludicrous for Christians to worship the dead Jews of the past, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while ignoring the Goldbergs that live across the street. The Goldbergs are the family of Jesus Christ. But Hagee has also said his support of Israel derives from passages in the Bible. Those passages prophesize that the end of days depends on the Jews ruling the whole biblical land of Israel. But he says that's not his sole motive in backing Israel. We do not support Israel for any end time scenario. We support Israel for Bible reasons that have been there for 2,000 years. Israeli leaders have welcomed Hagee and the support of evangelicals. Asher Yarden is Israel's consul general in Texas. As we say, a friend in need is a friend indeed. In July 2006, with Israel battering Hezbollah positions in Lebanon, Reverend Hagee rallied more than 3,000 evangelicals in Washington and got them to lobby Congress in support of Israel's controversial war. Israel found encouragement in that support. When the war in the north of Israel took place in 2006, that uh, from our good friends among the evangelical Christians, uh, there were special expressions of uh, support. But Palestinians, including Christian Palestinians, say Hagee and his followers are ignoring them. Tony Kateli is with the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. He says Palestinians are living under Israeli occupation or in exile and are being overlooked. The plight of the Palestinians isn't completely understood in this country, particularly by the evangelical movement. No matter what they believe religiously, there are people who are suffering in reality. And that that is a very big divide that needs to be crossed. Jews and Israelis are not unanimous in the embrace of evangelicals. Jews who support territorial compromise with the Palestinians oppose the relationship because many evangelicals want Israel to continue the occupation of Palestinian areas. Some Jews are put off by the Judgment Day beliefs of evangelicals. But Mark Friedman, executive director of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio, says he stands by Hagee. From a personal perspective, I think that I'm a lot more worried about uh, an Armageddon 
that might come from Iran than I am from any Armageddon that is premised in theology. So despite theological differences, the unusual relationship between evangelicals and the Jewish state on its 60th anniversary is likely to continue, at least in the near future. Greg Flakus, BOA News, San Antonio, Texas. So we see that there's a very strong bond between uh, evangelicals, especially dispensationalist evangelical Christians, and the modern state of Israel. Uh, but uh, there's another side to that story. Uh, there, as this slide says, there are hundreds of thousands of Arab Orthodox Christians who live in Israel and throughout the Middle East. They are the descendants of the first Christians, and they have a different view of the modern state of Israel uh, than the evangelical slash dispensationalist Christians. Here is a, a, a video by an Orthodox bishop in, in Israel. <laughs> وهي المدينة التي تحتضن أهم مقدساتنا المسيحية والإسلامية الفلسطينيون المسيحيون والمسلمون في القدس يعانون من الاحتلال يعانون من قمعه وظلمه واستبداده وضطشه الاحتلال يعاملنا في القدس وكأننا ضيوف وكأننا غرباء في مدينتنا وهذا تجسيد لسياسة الأبرتهايد الممارسة بحق أبناء شعبنا في القدس بشكل خاص وفي فلسطين بشكل عام ولكننا سنبقى في القدس مدافعين عن مقدساتنا وأوقافنا ورافضين لسياسات الاحتلال لن نستسلم سيبقى شعارنا دوما الحرية والكرامة لشعبنا الفلسطيني مقدساتنا ستبقى لنا القدس ستبقى لنا ونحن نرفض الإجراءات الاحتلالية ونرفض القرارات الأمريكية الجائرة والتي تأتي في سياق دعم السياسة الإسرائيلية الاحتلالية في مدينة القدس بعد أيام يحتفل المسيحيون في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها بعيد الميلاد وسوف تزدان شوارع وساحات المدن الأوروبية والعالمية بالأنوار والأشجار والزينات إلى آخره أنا أود أن أذكر المسيحيين في كل أرجاء العالم بأنه لا معنى لاحتفالكم بالعيد إذا لم تلتفتوا إلى فلسطين التي هي أرض الميلاد والأرض التي منها انطلقت الرسالة المسيحية إلى مشارق الأرض ومغاربها مغارة الميلاد في بيت لحم النور الحقيقي نور الميلاد سطع في بيت لحم وبالتالي نداؤنا نوجهه إلى كل الكنائس المسيحية شرقا وغربا بضرورة أن تدافع عن فلسطين عن أطفال فلسطين عن قضية فلسطين فليكن شعارنا في عيد الميلاد الحرية لفلسطين ولشعب فلسطين Yeah, I love reminding people that it's not the role of the media. To In short, the Orthodox Church does not believe that the Jewish people are the New Testament people of God. Therefore, the Orthodox Church does not view the modern state of Israel to be necessarily a fulfillment of divine prophecy. Now, this belief should not be construed that the Orthodox Church is hostile to Jews or is anti-Semitic. To the contrary, the Apostle Paul writes, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternal, eternally blessed one of God. Amen. Paul knew that his biological people, his ancestral people, the Israelites, were being replaced by the church as the people of God forever. But he never ceased to love his own people and yearn for their salvation. That was one of the reasons he was so tireless in leading them and all the people to Christ. He certainly did not consider them to be an alternative people of God in, in no need of salvation. 
Orthodoxy follows Paul's example and yearns for all to come and to receive Christ, including the Jewish people. We do not know what God has planned for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Perhaps he has preserved them for the past 2,000 years and brought them back to their former homeland, homeland for a reason. Perhaps they will turn to Christ sometime in the future. However, this is mostly hope and conjecture, not a proven fact, as the dispensationalists claim. Now, regarding the modern state of Israel, there are many reasons why a Christian, including an Orthodox Christian, might choose to support them, choose to support the modern state of Israel. A person may be pro-Israel because he is simply fond of the Jewish people or sympathetic to them because of the Holocaust. A person may support the modern state of Israel because of their military prowess or because they are pro-American or because they are the closest thing to a democracy in the Middle East or because they hold many Western values. But the belief that they are another people of God in hibernation waiting to be restored and to replace the church in the future is not one of those reasons for Orthodox Christians to be pro-Israel. So now we'll take, shift gears a little bit and for the rest of the class we'll look at dispensationalist interpretations of key scriptures. From the orthodox point of view, dispensationalists tend to dissect key passages of scripture. They take a passage that is a natural whole and divide it up into separate unnatural pieces. The divisions are based on presuppositions of church versus Israel and dispensations and works versus faith. These divisions are inserted into this, the text but not derived from it. And of all the passages from the Gospels, two are especially rich in the teachings of Christ and beloved by Orthodox Christians. And th these are the Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew 5, and the Olivet Discourse, which is in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. So let's take a look at these and how uh, the Orthodox and Dispensationalists look at them completely differently. These passages are beloved because we can we read them. We can join the original first century hearers and sit at our Lord's, Lord's feet and humbly soak in every word. Their truth is undiminished by the passage of time. They are fully applicable to us here and now, and they still have the power to transform us. That is why we Orthodox are disturbed by how these passages are treated by leading dispensationalist commentators. To us, Christ's words were intended for all people for all time, but to just dispensationalists, Christ's words must be carved into separate pieces and assigned either to the church or to Israel or to past or future dispensations, which we are told do not apply to us today. And those parts in which Christ's teachings, uh, which clearly link works to salvation, dis these parts, the dispensationalists tend to spiritualize. The Sermon on the Mount is the first example of this dispensationalist this dissection. Whereas we Orthodox view the Sermon on the Mount as applicable to all people for all time, leading dispensationalist Lewis Sperry Chafer write, states just the opposite. There is a dangerous and entirely baseless sentiment abroad which assumes that every teaching of Christ must be binding during this age simply because Christ said it. The fact is forgotten that Christ, while living under, keeping, and applying the law of Moses, also taught the principles of his yet future kingdom and the end of his ministry in relation, relation to his cross. He also anticipated the teachings of grace. Schaefer continues, again, it is not unreasonable for us to recognize that these kingdom teachings should apply, directly apply to a yet future age. The Bible is one revelation from God to all peoples and of all ages. It is not difficult to understand that much of the scripture applies to conditions which are not now wholly in the past, nor should it be difficult to understand that some of the scriptures apply to conditions which are wholly in the future. He, he finishes, if this threefold dispensation of the teachings of Christ is not recognized, there can be nothing but confusion of mind and consequent contradiction of truth. Now, certainly Schaefer is correct that parts of the Bible deal primarily with the past. When, we're looking, when we reread Genesis, we know that we're reaching into the distant past. And there are other passages that deal primarily with the future, such as the book of Revelation. But he's not correct that a single passage of Scripture jumps from the future 
then to the past, then back to the future, then back to the present, with no textual reason for ju justifying such jumps. One verse may apply, uh, according to dispensationalism, one verse may apply to the dispensation of grace, which is where they say we are now, but not to the, uh, not the, uh, or the future or the past. A few verses later in the same passage, these verses apply not to the dispensation of grace, but to the tribulation in the millennium, which is in the future. A few other, a few verses later, the same pass of uh, same passage verses apply to now the dispensation of grace, grace, but none of the other dispensations. So we'll see how this works. How this jumping around and assigning one complete passage of scripture and giving it all kinds of different applications when the, we would never get that from the text itself. It comes from, from theological presuppositions held by dispensationalists. So for example, Orthodox will easily recognize this. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So to Orthodox, we would say, oh, that has, that, that's a beautiful saying by Christ of encouragement for us now. Louis Perry Schaefer says, mourning does not belong to the bride of Christ. To her, a different message has been given. Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Mourning is the portion of Israel until her king comes. So, uh, as you can see by these arrows, he would take those words of Christ and assign them to a future dispensational of what we sometimes call the millennium and sometimes call the kingdom. But it is not now, and it is not in the past, and it is not in another future dispensation called the tribulation. Christ says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Lewis Perry Chafer says, in, in contrast, contrast to the ninefold self-earned self -earned blessings of the kingdom, the believer under grace is to experience a ninefold blessing which is produced in him by the direct power of the indwelling spirit. It will be seen that all that is demanded under the law of the kingdom is a condition of blessing under grace, divinely provided. So he takes... A few verses later, in the same passage, it says, now he's saying, well, this, is, this isn't the present. I mean, this is now, not the, the kingdom or millennium in the future. So this continues with, uh, this is the treatment of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord says at the, uh, uh, as part of the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Louis Berry Schaefer, a, one of the leading dispensationalists interprets that this way. In this age, God is dealing with men on the ground of his grace that it is in Christ. His dealings with men in the coming age are based on a very different relationship. At that time, the king will rule with a rod of iron. This prayer is, by its own expression, a kingdom prayer. And when he says kingdom, he's talking about the millennium, uh, distant in the future, so therefore it does not apply to us today. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, just a few, few verses down. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in, be in danger of hellfire. So this is also from the Sermon on the Mount. And the uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, a leading dispensationalist, interprets that this way. In this portion of the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount, the extreme legal penalty for wrongdoing is imposed. Is any child of God under grace in danger of judgment or ought the awful penalty of hellfire? This argument is uncalled for in the light of the scriptures. So here he's saying that this verse, uh, uh, the, these words of Christ are not for now because it's impossible, according to him, uh, for any of us to be uh, in any kind of spiritual uh, danger uh, be because of what we say or do. John Wolverine, another leading, uh, almost founding member of dispensational theology, says this, goes through the same process. Still on the Sermon of the Mount, talking broadly about the Sermon on the Mount, John Wolverine writes, the Sermon on the Mount is, as a whole, not church truth precisely, it falls short of presenting the complete rule of life expounded at greater length in the epistles and is not intended to delineate justification by faith or the gospel of salvation. So he's basically saying uh, the Sermon on the Mount is not for us for now, or it's incomplete uh, because it, it, 
uh, says things that contradict the doctrine of, of doctrine of grace as taught by dispensationalists. The same thing happens in the Olivet Discourse. Another major sermon of Christ, the Olivet Discourse, is similarly dissected by dispensationalists. In this study of the end times, the Olivet Discourse is especially important as it focuses on Christ's own predictions of the end times. In fact, it, it introduces itself from Matthew chapter uh, 24. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And this is a, a question that all responsible Christians should be asking. So this, the question was asked on our behalf of Christ. So we could say that the rest of the entire Olivet Discourse is his answer to that question. It is a very extended uh, discourse. So the Olivet Discourse, in answer to the question, what, how will we know you're coming? What are the signs of the end of the age? And Christ is speaking this to, to uh, his followers uh, before he went to the cross. John Wolverd says, in Matthew 24 and 25, the expositor should therefore understand that the program of God for the end of the age has in view the period ending with the second coming of Christ to earth and the establishment of his earthly kingdom, not the church age, specifically ending with the rapture. So he basically says this whole thing is not for now. It's for a different time. It's for after the second coming, um, uh, uh, the, the period ending with the second coming, not the church at present. So again, he puts it in a, in a, a different category and, and uh, which the Orthodox Church would, would certainly disagree with this. Uh, our Lord during the Olivet Discourse says the following, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Watch therefore, for you know neither the, the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. John Walward says, in this illustration of the coming of Christ, as also is true of the previous illustrations in Matthew 24, distinction must be made between interpretation and application. Following the strict rules of exegesis, the context indicates that the subject is the second coming of Christ to the earth and not the rapture of the church. So again, he carves out a specific uh, place to put this particular verse, and where he puts it is in a time not for the now, but for the tribulation, which is sometime in the future. Lewis Berry Chaffer says something similar. He says, this discourse, like that known as the Sermon on the Mount, is addressed to Israel. This major address is given to the disciples privately, and these 12 are here treated as Jews and as representatives of the Jewish nation. Jews in the tribulation will profit exceedingly by these words and recognize them as the words of their Messiah King. So again, he takes this entire Olivet Discourse and puts it not for the present, but sometime in the future. A few verses down in the Olivet Discourse, our Lord says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Lewis Berry Chafer interprets that this way. This is not a kingdom condition of final salvation and or grace. It was addressed to a nation who were to experience great tribulation. He's talking about the Jews here, not the church. Uh, and, and forms of promise that will be of most precious to those to whom it shall apply. So also the verse that follows is often confused with the present gospel of grace. So again, these words which we hear from our Lord, Louis Barry Chafer saying, that's not for now, that is applies to sometime in the future. The Olivet Discourse continues, our Lord says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Of this, which Orthodox would recognize as being the second coming of Christ, and his only return to earth, Lewis Berry Chafer says this, 
This is in no way comparable with the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. That is at the end of the thousand years kingdom. This is before. So again, he's assigning these words not to the present, uh, but to the, uh, the tribulation. So as a, so very, very different reading of, of uh, by a leading dispensationalist from that of uh, Orthodox. So why is it the Orthodox do not believe in the dispensational interpretation of these very key scriptures? And in a nutshell, hopefully this will, will get the point across. You have Christ teaching, and he says, blessed are the poor and those who, uh, those who mourn, blessed are the meek. And the dispensationalists say to us, no, this, does, this applies to Israel and does not apply, apply to you. We hear our Lord saying, our Father who art in heaven, the dispensationalists will say, this applies to Israel, not you. Christ says, you have heard, but I say unto you, the dispensationalist says of these words, this applies to Israel, not to you. Christ says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins. The dispensationalist will say, this does not apply to you. Christ says, and he shall separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The dispensationalist says, this does not apply to you. Christ says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The dispensationalist says, this does not apply to you. Dispensationalists declare basically that most of the Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse do not apply to the original hearers or to the church. They see that these sermons apply only to Israel in the distant future when where the church has been raptured and Israel is restored uh, back to being God's uh, people on earth. Orthodoxy could not disagree more. We do not believe that these pivotal sermons are time capsules to be buried in the ground now and then opened and read millennia later. We believe that Christ, Christ preached them to the church and the world. Christ preached them for his people, the church, to apply to themselves and to live here and now. So this is the difference. This is why orthodoxy do not at all agree with the dispensational interpretations of these major passages of scripture. Notice the difference. On the right, we see the uh, <coughs> Uh, icon of of the uh, gospel. So for us, when Christ says, "Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek," the Orthodox Church says, "This applies to us. Let us be attentive." When Christ says, uh, "He teaches us the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven," the Orthodox say. say this applies to us. Let us be attentive. When Christ says, you have heard, but I say to you, the Orthodox Church says, this applies to us. Let us be attentive. When Christ says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, the Orthodox Church says, this applies to us. Let us be attentive. When Christ says, and he shall separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, the Orthodox Church says, this applies to us, let us be attentive. When Christ says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, the Orthodox Church says, let it, this applies to us, let us be attentive. So this concludes uh, the class today. Uh, thank you for joining me. I encourage you, if you wish, to drop me a line at this email address that I, I have here and uh, be happy to respond to uh, any uh, questions, concerns, observations, and I'll probably be able to write you back. And uh, again, just as a reminder, if you're new to this, uh, my main goal is I'm basically uh, using this to teach Orthodox primarily uh, of our own beliefs about the future and help them have a good understanding of the differences between us and our evangelical friends. Uh, if you are an evangelical dispensationalist, uh, if I'm not really trying to uh, change your view, uh, you're not really, I'm uh, um, not going after you in any way, but although you may not find interest in that. So thank you for coming and we will continue this uh, series soon. Have a good day.